Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'm excited to have our panelists here today. Uh, what we wanted to do is have a bit of a conversation to set the, the workshop here and the work of Barrett in the context of some broader national as well as provincial conversations around restoration. Um, so we have some excellent panelists here from a wide range of different perspectives. And we want to hear about some of their motivations, some of their challenges that they're experiencing for restoration, as well as potentially future opportunities that they're seeing. Um, and what we really hope is that it's going to lead to new perspectives and new ideas uh, emerging through this conversation for you, and also hopefully plant some seeds for new ideas and new perspectives to emerge throughout the day here. So what we really want to do is invite you to use this panel session to kind of step into today uh, get active, kind of let the conversations motivate your thinking and your actions here today. So we hope that it'll encourage you to explore maybe new angles to questions that you've been wrestling with. We hope that it'll maybe introduce you to new perspectives and encourage you to maybe meet some new people today and build some new relationships. Um, and we also hope that it starts to get you thinking about actions to uh, think about how the work here at Vera could be applied either in your own work, in future work, in your research projects, et cetera. Um, so the process here is we're gonna run a little bit of a talk show. Uh, we have a series of questions for everybody. Uh, we have the four panelists here from different perspectives. Uh, and it's gonna feel a little bit uh, kind of like a talk show, a bit less like a panel discussion. So um, I'm gonna try to do my best Peter Manthridge or George Strombolopoulos here on, on the stage here. Um, so why don't we get started with introductions here. Uh, Jesse, why don't we have you start us off, if you can introduce yourself, your role, and a little bit of your interest, why you're here and interested in being a part of the discussion at Barrow today. Uh, yes, thank you, Matthew. So um, my name is, is Jesse Tigner, and I own a small consulting and independent research company called Swamp Donkey. Um, and I'm, I'm very thankful to be here today. Thank you very much for the invite. Also, um, thank you very much for the, um, for the video link uh, accommodation. My, my wife just had another baby, so I, I couldn't, um, couldn't get away. He's still very, very small. Um, so my, my interest, I, I um, sort of always tell people I, I have one foot in, in ecology and, and one foot in, in um, oil and gas sort of field operations. Um, I uh, came to Alberta originally from the States to do uh, a master's degree at the U of A, um, which was looking at wildlife response to different kinds of seismic lines. Um, and that parlayed me into uh, becoming an ecologist and, and sort of a, a project manager for a um, small seismic firm in Calgary. Uh, where I worked for about 10 years. And then I started this company where my, my interest is sort of um, developing kind of workable solutions from an applied ecology perspective. So, so frequently I saw really great science occurring, um, but the, the ability to leverage those findings to um, kind of land use planning and best management practices was pretty limited because there wasn't a very good link between the practitioner side, as, as Greg was talking about earlier, and, and the science side. So that's that's sort of my interest here, generally. Um, the last four years or so uh, through Swamp Donkey have done a lot of different um, linear, feature, linear feature restoration projects. So I'm, I'm interested in, in that sort of linkage between the applied science and the operations from the perspective of, of delivering um, feasible and, and um, effective uh, restoration treatments. So Great. I'll stop talking now. Excellent, Michael. Yeah, good morning folks. Um, Matthew, when you said it was a, a talk show style, I expected like uh, comfy couches and stuff like that. And I feel like this is a little different, but. Um, you probably expected a charismatic host. So I yeah, all good. Um, I'm Michael Cody with Synovus. Um, yeah, as you guys know, we have a, a big uh, restoration project that's part of our um, public ESG goals and, uh, and internal metrics. And so we have a big interest in it. It relates, of course, to um, you know our, our long-term performance on the Northeast landscape. And so we've been involved um, for a little over a decade and um, 
continue to be super interested in seeing this develop, not as a, a recipe that we've kind of already got baked, but um, something that we um, embrace as, as an opportunity to continue to, to learn and be informed by the evidence, I think. Hi, I'm Melanie Dickey. Uh, I'm also going to complain a little bit about the chairs. My feet don't even touch. I feel like a child. <laughs> so if I spin, I'm just going to go with it. And I might be facing the wall at one point. Um, I'm a caribou ecologist. Uh, so my interest in being here is very much from a caribou perspective. We've heard a lot about caribou so far in the introduction. So that's going to be my lens. Uh, I've been working on caribou and how human land use affects caribou through a myriad of ecological pathways for 10 years now, which counteracts me feeling like a child a little bit. It makes me feel old. Um, and I'm a research coordinator and research associate at the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. And I'm also doing a PhD at UBC Okanagan. Both of my roles are very caribou centric. That's me. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Thea Carpenter. I'm a wildlife biologist with Canadian Wildlife Service, Environment Climate Change Canada within the prairie region here. Um, in my current role, I support all aspects of uh, caribou recovery. So very similar perspective here, uh, but that essentially under, fits under the general umbrella of federally at least, of basically facilitating stewardship, stewardship actions that will help support caribou recovery. So working with collaborators, partners across jurisdictions to try to identify you know, shared objectives and how we can work together to further the caribou recovery objectives. Great, fantastic. Maybe we'll keep the microphone with you, uh, Yeah. So tell us a bit about woodland caribou recovery and planning at the federal level. And why is restoration so important and what tools are needed to advance our knowledge and implementation? All right, well, that's a big, big topic there, gone for a long time. Um, but I suspect most people in the room here, you're already aware that caribou, they're uh, listed as a threatened species under the Federal Species at, at Risk Act. Um, so that for woodland caribou, that includes Southern Mountain caribou and boreal caribou. And as Greg touched on earlier, um, caribou are a bit unique in their use of the landscape relative to other ungulates and that they, they avoid some of those early successional habitats and really target mature forests. Um, so when it comes to the recovery, or sorry, the federal listing, inherent in that is development of a recovery strategy for the species and identification of critical habitat. So the federal government, when tackling this question of critical habitat, which is uh, the habitat necessary for the survival and recovery of the species, they took the approach of across the distribution, assessing the likelihood that a population would be self-sustaining. So essentially um, what they did is that they looked at what landscape factors would um, uh, correlate with the ability of uh, of a population to have adult high adult female survival and recruitment, and identified that the um, at a landscape level, this is highly related to cumulative disturbance, so both an anthropogenic disturbance as well as wildfire disturbance. And at the time, policy decision makers identified that what we would accept as sort of the minimum standard of likelihood of self-sustainability of a population was 60% probability. So when we talk about the critical um, habitat definition, uh, this six, you, most people I think have heard that we uh, are trying to maintain an abundance of 65% undisturbed habitat. And, we, and it was identified that the range level, so the area occupied by a a local population is the best scale at which to do that. So this 65% undisturbed habitat, 40% in SK1 range, 
uh, correlates to a 60% probability that that population is going to remain self-sustaining. And I'm sure most of you have been exposed to that before. I do think it's worth kind of bringing up this sort of 60% probability, because if we think about that, that's sort of a minimum threshold that, that population is going to be self-sustaining. And then if we look within our region at our ranges, you know, a large portion of the caribou ranges were quite a ways below that target threshold for minimum self-sustainability. Um, and then with the caribou biological attributes of requiring that old mature forest, it really ties into that need for habitat recovery and restoration. So uh, the work that is done here by Bora, Vera, sorry, is definitely uh, very <laughs> critical to that. And when I think of knowledge, I think of, um, you know, so what are the newest and best advances and in, in best practices that will correlate to, to direct outcomes for caribou? So which of these new techniques in recovery and restoration are enabling caribou or sorry, are enabling those outcomes that we need, such as, uh, avoidance by alternate prey species or our predator species, increased use. Um, and those prioritization tools are very critical. So we know we have limited resources. So our ability to identify on the landscape where those key areas that we need to target for habitat restoration are, are gonna be crucial to moving forward for caribou recovery. And then as well as just any sort of advancements in restoration practices are gonna incrementally accelerate our ability to uh, get toward, back towards that critical habitat threshold. I think, did that Thank answer you. your question? Covered it, <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Jesse. So Jesse, you've been involved in projects in Alberta and BC related to restoration. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of interest related to restoration and also tell us a bit about the motivations from the organizations you're seeing. Um, yeah, so I, I, <clears throat> I think that there's, first of all, in terms of interest, uh, like explosive. Um, when I first started doing restoration stuff like four years ago, there were a handful of, of different groups doing things. Um, there was some of the, the early um, Sonovus and, and Cosia uh, stuff, or whatever the precursor of Cosia was, I can't remember. Um, and there are a few things here and there. Now, it's like all the rage, and there's like giant um, uh, granting envelopes that are dedicated solely to restoration. It's a, it's a whole new world, um, and it's, it's not happening in a few isolated pockets. It's happening sort of across Alberta, across um, Eastern British Columbia from the south to the north, um, starting to hear discussions about it in other jurisdictions as well. So it's it's something that is is very uh, mainstream. Um, in terms of the the projects that that I've worked on, I would say that I, I sort of think about them. There's almost like kind of two worldviews um, competing. That's probably not the right word. Two worldviews um, underpinning a, a lot of the restoration effort um, that are going on. So, so um, some of my work is is more um, industry focused. Some of my work is more um, First Nation focused. Uh, and and um, I, I sort of see those two streams a bit as an hourglass. And in some capacities, the alignment is very very um, close. And in some capacities, the alignment is is much further away. So, like. Um, the, the sort of one one stream of thinking is is more of a uh, I would say a legislated underpinning. So, um, like Taya said, there's there's um, you know a, a SARA listing. So there's a sort of a federal hammer um, around the requirement to do something about caribou. Um, one of the things that is being done is is um, you know widespread restoration efforts, obviously, um, in conjunction with some other things as well. Um, and and that sort of focus has been very, I would say, um, modeled after the the bear approach, or perhaps the bear approach is modeled after the thinking. I don't know, but um, let's figure out the mechanisms and the drivers as to why we are seeing the patterns that we are seeing on the landscape, and then let's um, address those uh, in a research capacity, in an applied research capacity. Let's figure out 
Let's figure out why the things we don't want to be happening are happening and then attempt to counter those. Um, and on the, on the First Nation side of things, it's a, it's a bit different uh, in that the, the point of the restoration in some capacity is to restore a relationship to the landscape. So um, a landscape undergoes a, a series of disturbances through, through land uses, um, and that though those actions have impacts on um, how animals interact with one another, where animals occur on the landscape, uh, where plants grow on the landscape, and it then in turn impacts how people and community members uh, and land users then go out onto that landscape to interact with the landscape. So the, the driver is a bit more um, holistic in approach and a bit more um, relationship in approach in that the goal of, of the restoration is sort of in part to restore caribou habitat, but much more broadly is to uh, restore the relationship that um, people remember, to restore the relationship that people hear about from stories from elders um, in both how the landscape used to be used and how caribou used to be used. So I, you know, I, I um, I'm, I'm not a, a member of the First Nation, so I, I can't really speak to this very much, but it's certainly in some nations, one of the overriding goals of, of caribou restoration is to be able to restore that relationship of using caribou and harvesting caribou. So it is not, um, the, the idea is, is not necessarily protecting caribou for caribou's sake. Um, so I, I think that in a, in a, the, the sort of pinch point of that hourglass where, where both of those worldviews really um, are, are really closest is right now there is a lot of money that is generally tied to caribou, but we ought to be able to collectively use this to restore a whole bunch of other things on the landscape. I don't think anybody really just cares about caribou. There are all of these other drivers, some of the things Greg talked about in the slide as well as a bunch of others. So let's try to leverage these mummies to restore, in this case, or in my case, linear features in ways that you know slow and prevent wolf movement to be able to act upon those um, negative population pressures of caribou. But let's also do it in a way that can restore some of the hydrological cycles that can sort, restore some of the carbon balances, can do things about birds, can do things about small mammals and all of those sorts of things. So it's a bit of a different, um, I guess, leveraging of, of the money and instead of just straight caribou, caribou, caribou. Um, I think that's about it. Great. Thank you very much for that perspective, uh, Jesse. And uh, Michael, maybe we'll transition to you if we can get the microphone to you. Um, so you spoke about Synovus's commitment to uh, seismic line restoration and some of the work you're doing in the Cold uh, Lake Air Weapons Range. Maybe can you tell us why that commitment was important to Synovus as a company? And also, can you maybe speak to the carbon component? Greg spoke earlier today about the importance of both carbon and caribou. Can you tell us a bit about how Synovus views that carbon aspect of restoration? Yeah, for sure. Um... I guess the, the first part of that answer, I mean, why did, why did we engage in landscape scale restoration? Um, obviously it's easy to paint out the business risk uh, associated with um, species uh, under threat and the potential for intervention and our ability to continue to access resources on the landscape and then also you know, reputational risk for our sector. So I think those were, were strong business rationale. Um, I think there was another one as well that I would point to, you know, we actually have a very involved regulatory system in Alberta, and some would argue, I, I would suggest it's relatively prescriptive. Um, and I think that many of us can kind of carry on and do business in the comfort of that. But I think there was also an opportunity for us to set an example and do something different that wasn't strictly driven um, by regulation. And, and so, you know, that I think that was another part of the thinking. Um, but I guess lastly, I will say we have a set of core values at Synovus um, that involve, you know, making things better and protecting what matters, uh, a couple of them. And I think that this project, it was easy to point out that it was, you know, that we had a problem on the landscape and that this was aligned with those core values. And so 
uh, I think those are really um, the high level reasons, you know, why, why we've done it. Um, and I'd say we're fortunate to have an executive that was very sensitive uh, uh, to the need and true to those values. So um, as far as carbon goes, um, you know, obviously, you know, that's a, an area of, of huge social concern right now. Um, and really the reality is, is that carbon when it's in soils and plants is associated with all kinds of good things uh, in terms of the values we want in the landscape in the long run, whether that's uh, wildlife or wood products or resiliency in the system. Uh, and when carbon's in the air um, right now, it's not a good thing. So obviously having that co-benefit um, associated with restoration is really important. And um, we also need to know that um, whether or not we're kind of in a trade-off mindset, we're doing something that's good for caribou and, and not good for another value. Um, and I think that with technical change, we can find a space where uh, we optimize, you know, both of those values. And so that's my thinking on, on that side of the question. Great, thank you. All right, let's hear from Melanie from a researcher perspective. Um, let's maybe transition to some of the early wins from Vera and some of the things that you're observing. So. Um, you're involved in lots of various facets, facets of research. So based on what you've seen so far from Vera, what do you see as some of the early wins? Um, I see that we're starting to build up the tools in our toolkit. Uh, there's a lot of kind of early strides to understand how we can evaluate the status of post-disturbance vegetation recovery on some of these disturbances. We've seen uh, a few wins in understanding the natural drivers of recovery on those lines and what might stagnate them, which of course can help for planning. Um, but from a caribou perspective, many of our wins are really targeted to setting us up for the next step of scaling up and really understanding what we can do for caribou. We've got some early strides and wins in understanding what restoration treatments we can use, but we've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of disturbances on those landscapes and for caribou to have even a minimal chance of self-sustaining populations, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. So I think Barra, the Barra team and a few other groups as well have really set the stage for us to take those tools in our toolbox and start operationalizing them and using them at scales that'll be hopefully meaningful for caribou. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jesse, maybe we'll transition to you as well from kind of a consulting kind of on the ground perspective, um, reflecting on some of the work so far from Bear that you've seen, what specific applications do you see? What's excited you and maybe why has it excited you? Um, yeah, I think I, I would, uh, I, I agree with, with what Melanie just said. I, I think that, um, a, a lot of the early wins, a lot of the things that are, um, exciting to me are, are sort of, um, setting the stage with what I see as a very strong foundation for, for moving forward. So I, I mean that in two ways. One, um, the the sort of overall you know philosophy of of the research groups and and trying to engage a, a team of folks maybe with disparate um, perspectives and opinions uh, and backgrounds I think is is a, a very good way to to you know sort of build a very strong applied research program um, I, I think that's really great um, I I think that the other component is um, for lack of a better term, kind of codifying um, some of the things that that maybe we have suspected for quite some time, uh, and then getting down into some of those details. Um, so, for example, um, you know, we've known sort of ostensibly that um, there's a, a, a litany of reasons that older style conventional bulldozer-based um, seismic line construction practices have stalled out recovery. And now we're in this phase of, we're not just understanding 
those general those generalities, but we're really starting to get into some of the the details and the mechanisms as to why that's going on from um, from a pretty detailed perspective. So I think that all of that's really good. I, I think that um, an early win that I'm I'm let's call it an early potential win that I'm not really seeing that much of. Um, that I on the one hand it's not the scope of Barra. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that it should be moving forward, um, is that if we are sort of thinking from a restoration mindset, I'm not sure that we are really setting ourselves up for a, a long-term win, because there's always going to be more stuff to restore. So currently, within at least some caribou ranges, the, the pace of new footprint is far outpacing far outpacing the restoration that we're putting in um, programs, restoration programs that are um, able to deliver a hundred or so kilometers of, of restoration in a season are really successful. That's like, that would be a, that's a metric of a very good restoration program. By comparison, a single seismic program is putting in several thousand kilometers of new line. And on the, on the one hand, those lines are fundamentally different. Um, but having been on many, many seismic programs, even the lowest impact LIS line, unless it's a hand cut, does incur um, an impact to an ecological system. So I think that there's a huge opportunity within Vera to leverage some of the understandings that have been gained from the restoration perspective and from understanding on about how older, older impacts are recovering and why, and parlaying that into a very aggressive use on the way new um, footprint features are put in. And I don't think it needs to stop with seismic lines. That could be every facet of uh, a footprint feature from a road to a pipeline to a facility to a well. And I think that I'm, I'm not sure that we're, we're seeing that broadly within the industry. I, I think that we are to some extent, but I, I do think that looking forward with the information from the past, kind of Barra has an opportunity to sort of help um, nudge that along in a, in a um, well-designed and well-studied way. Here, here. Maybe we'll get the microphone to pick up. Um, so based on what you know about uh, Barra so far, Thea, um, what are you hoping to learn more about here today? And what conversations are you hoping to have here today? So learn more about, um, well, personally, <laughs> uh, from the work that Barra does, I mean, it's all super relevant. So I'm just, I'm really thrilled to be here to just to be able to have those conversations and get the really fast snippets of information on, on, you know, what those current advancements are. So like I mentioned before, like knowing more about the best practices is, is so beneficial. Um, so aside from that more broadly, I think I have a really big interest in understanding. So how can we take these tools that Barra is developing and put them into application from a practitioner side? So so we're learning about how do we improve the restoration best practices. So, but as practitioners, where do we see what is it, what are the roadblocks to implementing those best practices? So, what do you see from your perspective and in the work that you lead um, as the challenges? And then how how can other people in the room, collaborators, how can we work together to to move past some of those challenges? So, from a federal perspective. Um, you know, we're really trying to facilitate collaboration on some of those issues. So just hearing about, um, you know, what are the, the hardline aspects of implementation and, and where can people in other roles fit in to support? So for instance, like First Nation communities and restoration practices, how do you see those integrating? Like how can cross-jurisdictionally we try to sort of advance some of these implementation aspects, I think, to be my key interest conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll get the microphone to Michael. 
Um, so Michael, where should we be focusing our efforts in the future to make the biggest gains on the topic of restoration and monitoring? So kind of looking into the future, where, where should we be focusing our efforts? Yeah, um, I'm not sure this is exciting for the crowd that's here, but I believe that the biggest gains are to be made in actually appropriate equipment for active treatments. Um, so most of the conversations that we have um, about restoration, certainly at the policy level, involve uh, start with money. Well, it's going to cost so much, and how do we tackle this massive problem? But I, I know that there's probably equipment that we haven't developed yet, but an opportunity for us to reduce the cost of active treatments by order or orders of magnitude with technology. Um, and I think that that's, um, that's going to be required um, and, a, and a great opportunity. And I, I actually don't think this problem is confined to Alberta. Um, linear features are all over the world. And so uh, I still think there's, there's further opportunity for that and a big market for it. Um, as far as monitoring, um, and I'll say this for Robert Albright's benefit, conifer stocking and growth um, continues to be, in my view, a pillar of what we do. And I know, you know, Greg um, told us all about his vision of the boreal, and I, I don't disagree with it, but I would point out that more than half of the boreal is actually uplands, upland forests. And so we can't forget about that either. Um, and there's certainly lots of important values that are associated with those. Um, so like it or not, it is a forest and in conifer stocking and growth is, is a central part of that. Thankfully, I think we're doing that in, in Barra. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Great. <laughs> okay, we're going to transition to Melanie's wish list here. So um, Melanie, if you're kind of thinking to the future as well, what tool or knowledge is on your wish list that you think will help advance our work related restoration and monitoring? So think five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. What's on your wish list? This was the hardest question for me, Matthew. Um, it's, it's hard to narrow it down because my wish in general is that we can get to a point where we have restored an entire caribou range or subpopulation to see if restoration will even work and under what circumstances it will and won't recover caribou populations. So any tool that these bright minds can think of that can get us to that point uh, would be on my wish list. I could not narrow it down aside from tools to help understand the current status of regeneration on features to help us target features that really need restoration work and maybe some that don't. And to really get a handle on how much restoration work we need to do. We know it's a lot, uh, but there's some pretty varying opinions about the status of vegetation on some of these lines, especially in remote areas. So narrowing down an understanding of how much work we have ahead of us will help to really facilitate getting that work done, I think. Um, one of the biggest challenges right now is probably not really in knowing what to do, it's knowing how to do it effectively. And a lot of that comes down to social aspects and political aspects, deciding where to go, um, and who's going to pay for it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think kind of understanding from a policy perspective where the barriers are right now, like you were saying, is, is going to be huge. So any tools to help us with that? So, great. Jesse, let's hear about your wish list. So if you could have any information or tool, and again, kind of thinking down the road, um, what would it be and why? So um, my my glib throwaway answer is a magic wand um, because it is just so incredibly difficult to deliver restoration on the ground. So I, I'm I'm going to sort of echo um, something that that Melanie said and something that Michael said um, because I see both of those as as the the biggest uh, things that that we actually can do in in lieu of, of a magic wand. 
So the first one is, is um, as it pertains to Vera, uh, work on the remote sensing front. So, so I, I think that there have been some truly stellar uh, leaps forward on, on the remote sensing front. But I think from a practitioner perspective, looking over a very large and a very remote landscape, those advances are, are not the right ones. Um, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean that as like, let's expand that part of the toolbox. At a fundamental level, we do not know where to go. We do not know which lines to treat, and we do not know how to get there effectively. And what we are faced with, especially in, in very remote areas, is hiring a helicopter and flying around. And it is, it's sort of old school. I'm not even old enough to say old school seismic, but it is old school seismic planning. We are literally out there um, for, for days and weeks planning these programs to be able to figure out which lines actually need restoration and which don't. So the, the, to sort of parlay that into a, a remote sensing framework, we're really a lot less interested in the super minutia detail. I don't know if we need to be able to identify individual conifer seedlings on a line. We just need to know like, what is the structure of this line? How much vegetation is here? And we need to do it quickly. And we need to do it in a way that can be repeated over and over so that we can maybe start to get at some of these things. Um, the other one is, is sort of echoing what, what Michael said on, on the equipment front. Um, the something that I think could be either added into Vera or developed as a bit of a sister thing uh, is is maybe um, development akin to um, like a, a Nate type program. I mean, we sort of what, what we kind of need. We're starting to lose stronger link, I believe, to um, the the tools. We need sort of a Swiss and do. Um, oh, let me um, turn my video off. You were rock solid for up until the last minute. Is that a little bit better? <laughs> yeah, okay. still um, I'll you. I'll keep talking and we'll see if it works. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Um, we need sort of like an insert chair for cockamamie machine ideas to deliver restoration in the field sort of thing. Um, we have, a, a, I think, a, a nice toolbox. People are, are sort of looking at a bunch of different opportunities for how to actually restore stuff to get to a variety of land covers easily. But they're all sort of in the same vein. We kind of need a bit of a step change, I think. Um, and I'm not sure we get there without that kind of dedicated engineering component and machine building component within this sort of Vera structure. Okay, great, fantastic. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I think that would be the stickiest, most creative name for an NSERC chair. So maybe, maybe we can get the scientists to take that name forward. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, and, and uh, thanks for those thoughts. Uh, we're going to open it up to the floor here in just a few minutes. So start to think about what questions you have for different members of the panelists uh, and what you would like to dig into. We'll have about 20 minutes to kind of field your questions and get different perspectives. Maybe before we get there, um, uh, let's just throw out a, two more questions out to the group here. So for Thea, uh, what core conversations and questions related to restoration do you hope your government colleagues will step into today? Core conversations for restoration. Um, well, one of the things I really benefit from being in situations like this in the workshop environment is just the opportunity, um, kind of related to what I was saying before, uh, in terms of speaking to uh, practitioners, uh, just people from with completely different perspectives. So what I would say <laughs> just broadly with my general recommendation for government uh, conversations today is just reach out to as many different people and different perspectives as you can, because um, you always learn something new from from getting that that true uh, um, 
perspective. So core conversations, I would just say, go up to somebody new and, and get their input on, on what they think is needed. Yeah. Great. And Melanie, how about from your perspective, if you think of your fellow researchers, grad students in the room, what conversations do you hope they're going to step into today? How can we scale up what we're doing? Um, it's really useful to have these tools that you're developing. Um, and I know you're thinking really hard about how they can be applied, uh, but I want you to push that a little bit harder and think about how they can be applied across the entire boreal of Alberta and BC and maybe Saskatchewan and WT. The point is we've got a huge area to cover and it's hard to think at those scales. It's nearly impossible, but those are the scales we need to be thinking about and talking about. Um, and I do also echo, I see a lot of these tables are, are very grouped in people that I would expect to be grouped. So let's try and not group ourselves with the familiar. Wonderful. Thank you for those kind words. And, and maybe that's your encouragement when you come back from the break after we're done the panel discussion, make sure you're choosing a different table, mix it up a little bit and find those new connections. Um, so thanks very much, Melanie. And, and thanks to all the panelists so far. Uh, let's open it up to the floor. Uh, what questions do you have? And I'm gonna kind of, let's see, how are we gonna run the microphone here? Um, this could just get a little complicated, but we'll roll with it. Okay. Uh, this is a question I think I'll direct to Melanie because she pretty much just touched on what I was going to ask. Any efforts to try to bridge the Vera tools with Planet software? Because Planet software has high temporal resolution, high spatial resolution. You, Some of the newer satellites would be probably used to get to uh, map differences in reflectance on even 3D seismic. And maybe there could be some, some kind of uh, translation of, say, the forest line mapper tool to planet data to try to make inferences over a much larger area. Yeah. Thanks, Lionel. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to talk from ABMI's perspective a little bit here, uh, just because I think it's highly relevant to the question. Um, right now, we're working on a program that actually uses the FLM mapper, forest line mapper, as the baseline for then including a whole bunch of different data types, high resolution LIDAR, optical data, we're exploring planet to get an understanding of the vegetation status on all seismic lines, all disturbances across all caribou ranges in Boreal, Alberta. And I think the challenge from there, I mean, that's a challenge on its own, but the challenge from there is then predicting out across time, not just space. Um, and I think that's where integration with broader remote sensing tools, earth observation type data is gonna be really, really important. So we don't always have to get that super fine resolution. There can be some kind of marriage between spatial extent and spatial resolution. I hope that kind of answers. There's more work to be done for sure. Great, thank you. Where's our next question in the room? There we go. Hey guys, I'm Chris. Uh, I work for Environment and Protected Areas. I'm a land change modeler there. And thank you very much for your comments and insights so far. I'm very curious to hear about the ecological differences from a caribou's perspective between conventional seismic lines and low impact seismic lines. Um, we count them differently when we're doing the caribou metrics right now. And I'm very interested to hear about uh, your perspectives on that. I'm guessing that's for me. Okay. Um, 
the reason we count them differently is because they're a very different beast physically. I mean, the science that went into defining that 35-65% threshold doesn't even count low impact seismic because you can't really see them in the way that we were mapping them. That has nothing to do with the ecology of it. There are some indications that how low impact seismic versus conventional influence things like wolf behavior in very different ways. Um, they're kind of just going like this instead of zipping across. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't have an effect by any means. It's just a very different scale, a whole different set of considerations. It maybe influences things like wolf movement, the abundance of deer and moose differently. We don't have a solid idea of how low impact seismic specifically influences that ecological chain to get to caribou. Um, yeah, it's a little bit different. I know Jesse has some thoughts on this. Do you want to add anything, Jesse? Um, sure. I, I think that if you if you look at the a bit of a broader um, base of literature, like from from not just Alberta uh, and not just wolves and caribou, there are pretty clear patterns that as you get narrower and narrower. Um, use at least not talking about travel speed but use drops off so for other species in the boreal for critters in south america for critters in australia so that that sort of it's not necessarily a, a switch that flips once you get into the realm of an lis width um, but as you certainly as you get much narrower uh, and there are a variety of groups um, attempting increasingly narrow lines there's some point at which it's sort of no longer an issue. So I don't know if that really helped to clarify anything or just continue to muddy those waters, but um, in in a couple words, still not really super clear probably. Okay, great. Who has the next question? Jeremy. Thanks. Um... Back to context that um, was discussed a bit in the federal strategy, et cetera, at the, um, at the start here. I, a question I get a lot when I speak to this about this issue to people who aren't involved in the science and the restoration space is pretty fundamental one related to success. Um, and it's like, forgive me, because it's unfair probably to the folks up there, but how many caribou are there in these ranges and what's their population trajectory right now? Yeah, um, I was given the mic, but I feel, I feel like this is a question that should probably be redirected to my provincial counterparts. So I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to, um, to talk with them because they have much more updated information um, on that if you're looking directly. Numbers. Um, and we know in the recovery strategy that which was updated in 2020 um, that say for instance in the prairie provinces the majority of the populations are on steeply declining trends and and we do have a long way to go hence some of the <laughs> the the talk up here about the much needed needed tools um so your your question was mostly about population numbers. And I, I think implying like, do we have the ability to recover those populations? Is there? Yep, yeah, yeah. Very focused on restoration. Yeah. Yeah, I just, that's, that's the one that I get from when I talk to this issue with other people, right? They're like, how many are there? And I can't. Yeah answer that question right <laughs> yeah I'm I, I realize it's an unfair question because you it doesn't sound like anyone up there has the number but I, well, <laughs> I mean vague numbers but um how many are there versus success are kind of maybe I think d different questions as well <laughs> I mean right now we know that 
uh, some populations are self-sustaining due to human intervention, um, and that really we have a, a long way to go to get those populations to be naturally self-sustaining. So, um, you know, that's essentially why we're all here in this room today is to kind of come up with the, the solutions that will. I think I'm kind of dancing around, so I'm not too sure the specific direction of the question. I'll pass it to you if anybody wants to add. Caribou are really hard to count. You can't see them from from the sky unless you're lucky, and you can't do so reliably. We have estimates of how many caribou there are. It's generally in the hundreds, depending on which caribou range you're talking about. Uh, we do that through mark recapture of their scats, generally. Uh, so that work is still ongoing to be improved and get some precision in those estimates. Instead, we usually rely on information about survival. How is how are adult female survival uh, numbers? Are they dying too fast? Uh, what's the recruitment rate like? Are we recruiting enough calves to offset that mortality of adult females? And we can play some games about getting more precise on our estimates, but we're nowhere near having enough adults surviving and calves recruiting into the population to even have sustained populations, like population growth growth rate of one. We're nowhere near there, unless I'm talking about places where we're doing some pretty heavy interventions, population level interventions. So we can play in that decimal dust of, you know, do we have 300 or 350 caribou? But regardless, the answer is we have not nearly enough. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to encourage some questions from the uh, carbon perspective as well. If there's anyone out there with a kind of a carbon perspective lens. I was just curious regarding some of the reclamation projects which have been shown there. One, one recovered very well. One did not, was not as successful. What is the time frame after the, the land is treated? to decide whether it was effective or is on its way to recovery. Um, so I, I don't know if, the, I don't know if there's a, a set number for that. We have um, a fledgling framework uh, for restoration uh, monitoring. And, you know, there's sort of the idea that we would have two stages for assessment, one a survival stage and then an establishment stage. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know there's a clear answer to that. I would suggest that we're probably talking about not quite a decade um, before you can really tell whether something has worked or not. Um, in the two photos uh, that Greg showed, I believe they were both from our um, Synovus Caribou Habitat Restoration Project and they were both dating from treatments in 2013, 2014-ish. I don't know if that answers your question adequately. But yeah. Can I add to that really quickly? Um, I think Michael's answer is spot on from the early signs of whether or not it's working for vegetation, which is a huge step in the right direction. Um, but that time scale is going to depend on which part of the ecological process you're talking about. That's just the beginning. It's probably going to take another decade on top of that to see other ungulate populations come down, wolf populations come down, more decades after that for caribou to actually come back. So when we're talking about metrics of success and timelines for monitoring that success, it really depends on which part of that pathway you're talking about. And I think we need to work through those pathways. Groups like the Regional Industry Caribou Collaboration uh, have kind of focused a little bit more on the wildlife part, so the longer response, which is a really nice complement to the bear work. And I think where we can really strengthen things is when we start to look at those pathways from start to, you know, some young buck in here can do the end point because I'll probably be retired by then. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Any questions from kind of the carbon lens? Maybe. Amanda, you seem hesitant. Okay. Can I ask a non-carbon question first? <laughs> I think I will. Um, so I had one question maybe for Jesse, but maybe Michael might be able to answer this too. Um, it seems like based on what I'm seeing um, in the pre-presentation in this uh, panel discussion, much of the restoration treatments are focused around mounding. Is there a reason why mounding has been the focus or am I wrong in that assumption? Have there been other tools like dozer based tools that have been looked at? Um, yeah, that's question number one. Um, I, so I, I'll hazard an answer. I think mounding is has been the focus because uh, that was the idea that we started with. And at this point, you know, nothing else has really caught on. Having said that, um, I think there's a ton of evidence for mounding being a really robust site preparation treatment, among others. And as you know, there's uh, different kinds of trenchers and plows and all kinds of things that have been tried. But if you look into the literature, mounding continues to be one of the most successful and also the one that uh, implies uh, the least surface disturbance of, of all, if you compare a, a bunch of different implements. But um, we're waiting for the next idea. Um, the, the other piece I would say is that, uh, you know, part of the thinking was obviously to create better places for trees to grow, but also to roughen surfaces so that they won't, weren't so easy to travel on. Um, and we think mounding does that effectively as well. So I'll, I'll add just the titch to that. Um, the, the work that we had we started to do in BC. Uh, we, we wanted to try to get away from mounding to make it more accessible to a broader um, subset of, of a community um, so that there could be sort of more participation. And we tried a whole bunch of different things um, and none of them worked. Um, so we stopped and, and we were sort of going maybe a little bit off the deep end with some hand tools and a variety of different things. And it just is, um, sphagnum is, is soft to walk on, but it's pretty hard to move around. So you sort of need that, that horsepower to, to do it. Um, the other thing that, that we do, um, which I guess you could consider like mounting adjacent or something, uh, is um, the whole hummock transplanting. So the stuff that sort of been developed and, and is coming out of Nate, um, and, and we're finding it uh, a very successful um, approach, uh, both because it introduces, you know, some of that surface roughness and, and, and what's likely contributing to slowing wolf movement along those lines, putting obstacles in the way. But we're also um, transplanting trees that are many decades old. So we're, we're sort of targeting hummocks that have trees like say a meter or a meter and a half tall uh, in many of these northern systems that's 70 years old maybe 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 older um, so we're able to sort of fast forward things and I, I think after three years of, of data we're seeing some pretty interesting outcomes there um, we're seeing that the the hummocks are sort of establishing themselves and the trees are holding on um, but they're not necessarily flourishing. Uh, the the growth rates are significantly less than than sort of the trees in the bush next door. Um, but it it seems to be like it's probably something that can be effective um, moving forward. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for the questions. I think we're going to maybe wrap it up there just to kind of set us up for a good amount of time for the rest of the day. So thank you all for the questions and maybe a round of applause for our panelists for their insights today. Thank you very, very much, Matthew. Thank you, Michael, Melanie, and Thea. Wonderful to have you here this morning. So I would like to release you now into the atrium for some refreshments, drinks, and 
refreshment foods available. Those of you, I think some of you might have come late and have not had the chance to register. Please do um, check in the desk and sign in, like to know who, who all was actually here today. And yes, and then we meet each other again, 1040 sharp, please, in here. So 35, 38 slowly, we'll call you in here so that we can continue the program at 1040. Enjoy.